Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to go very fast because we've got a lot to go through. William Golding here, so I'm starting off with some biography. I also want to just remind you that context must be used sparingly, okay? Other classes have talked about their concern that sometimes students start to write history essays. So all of the context is integrated, let's not forget that. And all of the context follows the AO2, the language form and structure, and it comes out of that. What do we need to know about Golding? Well, he was born in Cornwall, okay, and he was raised in an old farmhouse there. You might think quite an idyllic place to be raised, but actually he feels that he had quite a dark and tumultuous youth. In particular, I wanted to point out the fact that his father was a schoolmaster himself, so he came from a tradition of teaching. He was saturated in teaching and in young people's culture. At the age of 12, he tried to write a novel. He became very deeply frustrated and he became a shocking bully. And he talks about the pleasure he felt in bullying, the power that he felt in bullying. So when we're talking about Ralph, for instance, we see that dark side coming through him quite a lot. In short, listen to the quote, I enjoyed hurting people. World War II, most formative experience for him. Lots of direct action, including the sinking of the Bismarck, the biggest German uh, uh, destroyer ship. He had, saw lots of action, fending off uh, sub, uh, um, submarines and planes. Uh, he was a, a lieutenant. And of his war experience, he wrote, I began to see what people were capable of doing. Anyone who moved through those years without understanding what man produces, evil as a bee produces honey, must have been blind or wrong in the head. So we want to situate him within that post-war pessimism. And in particular, I'm thinking about two things. Auschwitz, which I think changed the whole course of European history. We've spoken about this before. The notion, the Enlightenment project, that education and art and civilization would produce moral betterment, called into question. Perhaps the greatest country in terms of culture and education, Germany, descended into barbarity and obviously ended in Auschwitz and the ovens in the death chambers. Of course, we also saw two nuclear bombs being dropped, and Lord of the Flies begins, doesn't it, with a kind of nuclear ho holocaust. Why are the boys there? They are kind of uh, transnational evacuees, aren't they? And that's how they end up on the island in the, in the first place. So let's not forget that violence frames the whole novel, does it not? Going back to teaching, uh, Golding took up a job in 1935 teaching unruly boys. And he noticed the kind of wolf pack mentality that existed in boys. Many of his ideas come out of direct empirical observation of what he sees as bullying and thuggish culture, which is endemic to school life. Some of you are probably uh, watching 13 Reasons Why at the moment. You'll be looking at how even today this kind of endemic bullying culture seems to exist, often with the backing of senior management and the institutions. Um, I thought I'd just remind you, assembly, this is the sort of school that I went to, where assembly was an incredibly formal thing, highly hierarchical. You'll notice that the older boys and the scholars will sit forward. You will notice the masters sitting in hierarchy. You'll notice the use of the academic gowns, etc. So some of the reference points that we have in the novel are of a kind of bygone age, or something that we'd still see today in the great public schools of England. Thought you'd like that, because that's a photograph taken from my school, King Edward in Johannesburg, this year. So nothing has changed. Notice the hierarchy. I left that school when I was in Standard 8, and I would have been standing at the back. You only got to sit in Standard 10. So this idea of rigid hierarchy is something that we see in the book. Yes, my wife. Public school, ironically, in England means private school. Okay, In America, public school means government school. But in England, when we refer to public school, we're referring to Marlborough and Eton and Repton and all the other great schools. And by Repton, I mean the school in England. Um, choristers in their lovely gowns, okay? I think there's something wonderful in the book. It's almost like a joke, a paradox, a piece of irony, isn't it? Golding is looking at the choir and thinking, in our minds we think of it as almost effeminate, don't we? The music is there for God. It is meant to be the zenith of spirituality. But instead, what do we see? 
we see that the choir is actually the locus of violence and fear and terror in the book. And I think that that's one of the book, aspects of the book that makes it so interesting and so lively. Corporal punishment is very much in the background of the book. It's what we could call the hidden curriculum, isn't it? All of the boys are used to hitting, and they're used to violence, and they're used to punishment. And we can see in the book that a number of the boys expect that, and they it's their expectation that leadership will involve the meeting out of violence. Here is a wonderful picture from Eton. This is still the uniform that people wear in Eton to this day. I used to live nearby in Egham, and I would see the Eton boys in their top hats and their ludicrous frock coats. And there's a kind of look of privilege, of ownership of the world. Does that come through in the pages of Lord of the Flies? To some extent it does, doesn't it? The idea of an endemic social class, an elitism, a born to ruleness. We must be thinking, uh, of course, in the background we have Piggy with his Cockney accent, over-intelligent for the boys. He's the boy who's got there through merit, hated and despised, just like George Orwell in real life, who went to Eton, who was a hated scholar. Ironically, you'd think a scholar would be admired, but within the context of the private or public school, they are actually despised quite often because of elements of social class, prestige and money. I also want you to think about, in the background, is the idea of imperial decline. Britain actually gets rid of its empire after the uh, Second World War, independence for India in 1948. Thereafter, all uh, the colonies in Asia and Africa start to follow. So as Golding's writing is writing within the context of Britain disintegrating as an empire, and I think we get quite a bleak view of patriotism in the novel, I agree with Ralph. We've got to have rules and obey them. After all, we're not savages, we're English, and the English are the best at everything. Again, there's a certain kind of caustic irony in that, isn't there? Golding is interrogating patriotism and nationalism, isn't he? Is he suggesting that these things actually produce violence in the boys? Well, I'll leave it to you to decide. I should have thought, said the officer, as he visualized the search before them, I should have thought that a pack of British boys, you're all British, aren't you? would have been able to put up a better show than that. I think Golding there is parodying that kind of nationalism, that kind of patriotism. He's calling it into question, isn't he? This is a, a country that's produced war and violence, etc., in Golding's eyes, and patriotism is being produced in quite a sort of cynical way. The conch I'm going to deal with now. There was a stillness about Ralph as he sat that marked him out. There was his size and attractive appearance, and most obscurely, yet most powerfully, those are our two adverbs that we want to learn, there was the conch. So Ralph's initial authority is largely established, apart from his good looks and his self-confidence, is the conch. The conch is a kind of totem, isn't it? It has this totemic significance that rules the boys. But as we've spoken about previously, it is only temporary, okay? It's quite interesting in this quotation that I have up here now that Jack jumps to his feet. We'll have rules, he cried excitedly, lots of rules. But when anyone breaks them, we all, etc. Lots of onomatopoeias. On the one hand, fun, childish diction. On the other hand, if we think about the actual reference, what is signified there, he's talking about violence, isn't he? So we have visions of order, don't we? The Ralph vision, which is the conch, fair rules, taking turns, and the Jack idea, that a punitive, retributive idea of justice, with elements of fear and corporal punishment, coming out of that boarding school system that I've spoken of. You haven't got it with you, said Jack, sneering. You left it behind, see, clever, and the conch doesn't count at this end of the island. Jack there understanding that the conch in itself has no power, that it's, in, it's impotent, that symbolic power can only take you so far. And if people stop believing in symbolic power, then it will be replaced by brute force. Jack understanding the power of the fist, of fear, of terror, and of torture. The rock struck Piggy a glancing blow. The, the conch exploded into a thousand white fragments and ceased to exist. Well, this is symbolism, this is the lay motif of Piggy, isn't it? That goes throughout. Piggy and the conch 
die together. They are absolutely inseparable. This is Piggy's world. And it's a world that's destroyed by Jack, and it's a world that is destroyed by pure physical violence. And I don't need to tell you that this is all within the context of the Second World War, and I'll come back to more of that in a moment. I want you to think as well. This is a map from 1954. If you could have a look here and see what's actually happened to Europe, this is the height of the Iron Curtain. Russia has been seizing more and more territory, has it not? It's pressing right into West Germany there. There's been a battle for Berlin. As Golding writes, democracy is incredibly fragile. America are fighting in Korea. You have the beginnings of the Vietnam War. You have the idea of the domino theory, that as one country falls to communism or to fascism, the others will follow. So as Golding is writing, democracy seems an incredibly fragile thing. And that may be as why, on the island, democracy is so easily supplanted, isn't it? By a mixture of charismatic leadership, fear, and violence. Intertextuality is my next topic. And this is very important because Golding wants you to think about other literature. He wants you to think about the intertext as you read. And I'll go into some of that now. First of all, the Bible is absolutely enormous. And the island is what we call a prelapsarian ideal. Prelapsarian is the idea of mankind before the fall. This is the true Garden of Eden. And the first chapter builds up this beautiful Eden-like imagery, does it not? But right from the beginning, I think we see that there are dark elements of foreshadowing that occur. Here's a quote here where they, where, that celebrates the excitement. They looked at the water with the bright, excited eyes. We have the glamour of, you know, the tropical island at first, don't we? The beauty of the water, etc. Golden builds that. And he does so on a structural level, because when he dismantles it, it's going to be complete. And let's not forget, we end with the island scorched and burned completely, don't we? And it becomes a kind of metaphor for mankind's impact upon nature and the environment. So I spoke a moment ago about the garden being contaminated, and that, of course, is through the imagery of the scar. The first thing that the boys do is land an aeroplane that scars and wounds the island. That personification is really important, isn't it? So it's a notion that there never really was a prelapsarian time. There was this glamorous, beautiful time, but actually lurking in the background is this dark imagery immediately. And you'll notice that the boys' uh, calls are described as witch-like, witch-like cries. Well, that's pretty sinister, isn't it? And it reminds us of all of that idea of fear, of the dark side, the burning of witches that occurred throughout Europe. This notion of what does fear do to us it unleashes violence, does it not? And Golding is always playing with ideas of original sin and the biblical idea that we are born in a state of sin. In Psalms it says, Behold, I brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Well, one of the ways of reading Lord of the Flies, intertextually, is to read it as a Christian story, as a story of uh, original sin. Of course, Golding also subtly uses the imagery of the snake, does he not, of the serpent of Satan. When the beast is first spoken of, it is described as a snake thing. Again, almost laughably ch childish and comical, like the boogeyman kind of idea. But when we think of the dark symbolism, when we think of the intertextuality, how it comes from the Bible and the beast-like imagery and how serious that is, it gives it that kind of macro reading, that allegory, doesn't it? That makes the Lord of the Flies a kind of allegory for a larger investigation of the nature of mankind. Of course, we need to know about the Coral Island. It's referred to twice. And this idea of a boy's own adventure paradise and how islands are a wonderful place where we can free ourselves from the constraints of society. All of these ideas are Rousseauian ideas, aren't they? That in nature we are purer, in nature we have more fun, and that it's civilization that constrains us and makes us so unhappy. And it is a whole genre, because when the boys first investigate the island, listen to what they say. Treasure Island, Swallows and Amazons, Coral Island. 
So I want you to understand that Coral Island is not an isolated text. It's a whole genre. It gives the boys a narrative that they've escaped. They've escaped the constraints of the adult world. They've escaped the dullness and mundanity of schools and education. However, as we're going to see, it's far from that, and they're actually entering a kind of dark, hellish terrain that they do not understand. And one of the reasons why they don't understand it is because literature peddles myths. It, it peddles myths about the natural state of man. Interestingly enough, uh, Coral Island is far from just being an innocent uh, story. Uh, it involves the boys, for instance, having to take on a tribe of savages in true British fashion, the dark savages are beaten by the pure and virtuous white boys, and they are able to protect their island from this terrible threat. They are also attacked by a vicious and nasty shark, which they fight off. Now, of course, within the narrative, the enemy is from without. The enemy is an external enemy, uh, enemy, uh, enemy that attacks you. But Golding wants to rewrite this, and this is where we'll make our quick link to Frankenstein, where Mary Shelley also had the intellectual maturity to see a monster not as something external, but something from within. And this is precisely what Golding is doing. He is moving evil from without to within. Much more sophisticated idea, I think, of the nature of evil. Now I'm going to move on to some of the ideas of hunting, tribalism, and fear. And fear and violence is at the absolute core of the book. It seems to be what Golding is telling us to be the primary motivator for human action. We know up until the point of the beast that the island is relatively orderly. And it seems that the coming of fear is what sparks this rage, this tribalism, and allows the aggression to be uncapped. Enter Jack. I've said a moment ago that actually it's when the beast enters, but arguably the beast enters when Jack enters with his choir. The dark imagery, this is a beautiful slide that actually shows you they seem like sort of harbages of death as they enter, don't they? And they are referred to as a creature. So you'll notice that they are de-individualized. The boys move as one. They are a kind of human creature. They're referred to as coming out of the darkness. They are associated with shadow. So let's see those image clusters. They are like the grim reaper, the harbingers of death, aren't they, as they emerge. And the creature was a party of boys. So it's a very dramatic, cinematic entrance straight away, isn't it? And of course the entrance ends in the fainting of Simon. And Jack's command and ruthlessness is established immediately. Of course, the choir also seem to bear a resemblance to kind of crusaders, don't they? If we think that they have this huge cross upon them, I don't think it's too far-fetched to say that maybe Golding wants us to see the dark side of religion and to remind us of the slaughter and bloodshed that was done with the name of God on the lips of people who murdered and stabbed and tortured. So Golding, once again, is presenting religion in a very interesting light, isn't he? Because Simon later is going to be described as a kind of messiah-like figure, isn't he? But at this moment, we are reminded of the darker elements of the Christian faith and how it led to slaughter and violence. One of the great things that the book does is it explores different ideas of the nature of humankind. And in this slide, what I've tried to do is to have the thinker, man is rational, man is brain, Man as intellectual, and an idea as man as body, man as beast. Man is something that is pre-rational, that actually works upon a mixture of physicality and emotions, that man is deeply tribal. And these two visions of man fight out, don't they, in Lord of the Flies. In The Thinker, we have Piggy. We have Ralph with his idea of fair play. And we have Simon with his ideas of spirituality, artistry, beauty, and aesthetics. On the other side, we have Jack and we have Roger, people who understand the power of physical strength, of weapons, of bloodshed, ideas that you appeal to people's fear, to the baser side of themselves. The deeper side of the cerebellum, I think it is in psychology, isn't it? 
the older side, the primitive side of our brain. And two figures that you can refer to, but once again, I urge you to refer to them only if the text suggests that the link is good, is Thomas Hobbes, the English philosopher, and Rousseau, or the idea of romanticism, the idea that human nature is good, that children are good. For not with nothing do we come, but training clay the clouds of glory, Wordsworth says. We come beautiful, we come innocent. Rousseau is at the back of romantic thinking, is he not, okay? Let's not forget that, Tom, uh, that uh, Thomas Hobbes tells us, in the state of nature, the life of man is short and brutish. On the other hand, Rousseau tells us that we should revere childhood as a beautiful state, a sacred state. The Victorians certainly did that, and that's where so much of this boy's own literature comes from, of happy children and telling adults that they should learn from children. Anyone who spent any time in an infant school will know what a load of rubbish that is. Now, something that seems to exist, and I love this Goya painting, he's one of my favorite artists, and I think we can use this idea in Lord of the Flies, is this is the idea of the sleep of reason. The sleep of reason produces monsters, Goya, the Spanish artist, tells us. What does he mean by that? He means that actually, by daylight, things seem rational and clear, don't they? And it seems like we can have order. But when it gets dark and you're asleep, what comes out of your dreams? Is there not a dark, imaginative side to us that is so much more powerful and that can completely overwhelm all of our notions of civilization and order? And I would argue that Golding helps to spawn a whole genre of books that end with books like uh, J.G. Ballard's uh, film came out last year called High Rise. Some of you may have seen it. And it's the story told in modern-day New York of all of these rich people living in an apartment block who suddenly go crazy. And it seems to me to be a very popular narrative, especially within science fiction, of how easy it is for disorder, how easy it is in The Walking Dead when the zombies break out, for things to become chaotic. That civilization is, in fact, an illusion, a thin veneer. And at the base of all of our order and reason, that primeval self is living, waiting to come out. And so this contests what we call the noble savage, okay? These two ideas are playing out all the time. I wanted to remind you that the beast comes from water, the beast comes from air. The beast is various things, the beast is in the trees, is he not? The beast is therefore an amorphous creature, continually changing shape. And this represents, doesn't it, the amorphous nature of our fears. We don't really know what it is we fear, but we fear something. And this fear is what is utilized by Jack and his acolytes in the book. Jack himself shrank at this cry with a hiss and indrawn breath, and for a minute became less a hunter, more a furtive thing, ape-like among the tangle of trees. We know that there's a whole pattern of imagery in which Jack is ape-like, snake-like, dog-like. We know that what uh, Golding is doing is drawing off Darwinian ideas of the degeneration of man. That at the base of man is a creature which is violent and a predator. And um, this is something that is explored by social biologists today. There's a big argument. Are we at nature killers, apex predators? Sapiens, after all, killed all other forms of mankind, including Neanderthal and Homo erectus. The people who we like to see as cavemen are the people that we killed, annihilated, and committed genocide with. So this is the idea that's been played out in the book quite a lot. I also want to remind you that even the good guys, and this is what makes Golding's characterization so good, he shows the universal nature of evil. In Ralph, for instance, the desire to squeeze and hurt was overmastering. That says he's killing Simon, isn't it? We know that Ralph is excited by hunting too. And in chapter 9, there were no words and no movement but the tearing of teeth and claws. Those metonyms for human beings are really interesting. It shows us, doesn't it, as predators, as killers. And this is in all the people. You will recall after the murder of Simon that Piggy wants to deny it too. So Golding is not so amateurish that he puts things in binary oppositions. He sees evil in everybody. And it seems to be the good man is not the man who is without evil, 
but rather that the man who actually acknowledges that and seeks to restrain that element in himself. This again could be seen as original sin, as we said earlier. Bollocks to the rules, says Jack. We're strong, we hunt. Interesting, contempt for order on one, on one side, and this kind of violence on the other. But when Jack does establish his community, he does so with ironclad rules, doesn't he? But the rules are not so much the rule of law, but rather an autocratic idea of justice, in which you do what you bloody well told by the chief. There is no need for justification for these. You do so because I will coerce you and hurt you if you don't. So, we might want to bring in a little bit of Freud, but again, be careful. We'll bring in Freud in so much as Freud's idea is that this irrational dark side, the pleasure principle, the unconscious side of your mind, like the iceberg shows, is the biggest side of your mind. You don't know it, you don't think it, but it's waiting there. And it's like a bottle of Coke that's been sh shaken up. It wants to come out, doesn't it? It's pressuring to come out. And what does the island do? It allows this darker side to come out when the boys feel these desires. Also, there's a very troubling bit of imagery, and I thought about whether to talk about this or not, but I think it is really dark, because um, Golding seems to link the lust for power and the lust to hurt with the sex inst instinct. And that's why on two occasions, but most notably on this occasion, the killing of the female pig is done within the codes of rape. You'll notice here, Jack found the throat, the hot blood sp uh, spouted, the sow collapsed under them, and they were heavy and fulfilled. Interesting. So why is he choosing this idea of sexuality to describe it? Well, I'll leave that for you to decide, but that seems to me something worth pursuing. Camouflage is a big element of it, and the path to degeneration. One of the key moments in the path, of course, is Jack discovering the mud, which allows him to paint his face. And this is the notion that if you can get out of the spotlight of society and civilization, if you're able to disguise yourself and be unrecognizable, this kind of releases you. And this is something that is backed up by a lot of psycho psychology. Uh, maybe, be careful again about using too much detail, here a wonderful book called The Lucifer Effect by Zimbardo based on the Stanford Prison Experiment where they show the natural inclination of people to commit violence if you give them even small items like sunglasses. So this notion that defamiliarizing your identity, hiding yourself, liberates the dark side of yourself. This is a very Freudian, Darwinian idea, isn't it? That the self has to be forced to be good. At the base of us is the desire to dominate, and to have what Nietzsche calls the will to power, this idea that we want to actually rule over others. Well, one of the ways of reading Lord of the Flies is to see uh, Golding as working within this dark tradition. I wanted to remind you, of course, there's another person working in this tradition, and that's Hitler, Goebbels, and all of his acolytes. The understanding that we need hate figures. At first, the beast is the hate figure, but later, Ralph is going to, uh, sorry, Jack makes his peace with the beast, does he not? And the hate figure will become Ralph and will become Piggy. This seems to be straight out of the pages of Nazi propaganda, the need to have a hate figure that you aim your loathing and your violence at. Simon, of course, is a really interesting figure because he's the highly symbolic kind of idea of spirituality a Messiah or John the Baptist style figure who has great insights, etc. But I also want to remind you he's largely impotent, is he not? In the face of power and brute force, Simon is killed very quickly. He's laughed at. He's inarticulate. And that's because his visions are difficult to express. Maybe Golding is reminding us as well that right-wing demagogic figures are so successful because their version of reality is so easy told in sound bites. But Simon's obscure ideas of reality are generally laughed at by the remainder of the boys. Wonderful scene, of course, is this one that you all recall, which is Simon with the Lord of the Flies. This is when he has his epileptic fit and we see him as a kind of prophet-like figure. 
Can I remind you that, like me, the Lord of the Flies speaks in the voice of a schoolmaster, mocking. He seems to represent the dark side of education, the dark hidden curriculum, institutional violence that Golding felt was at the base of British education. And the beast says, of course, fancy thinking that the beast was something you could hunt and kill. And he speaks to Simon, and again, that's when we realize the internal nature of the beast, the dark that comes within. And Simon is the prophetic character who realizes this first. But just like Plato in the cave, the person who sees the truth when he comes back to tell others, Simon is beaten to death. And then afterwards, of course, we have all of this beautiful imagery. And I'll ask you to make of it what you will. Because Simon dies as a kind of Messiah-like figure. He has these attendant creatures uh, around him. He has a, a halo, his hair is, uh, is surrounded by brightness. And they're all this wonderful seraphic imagery. And he ends as a kind of statue-like figure. Of course, the idea of Lord of the Flies comes from Beelzebub, the Hebrew word meaning Lord of the Flies. Uh, this was the Philistine God. So it's quite interesting that once again, Golding is using a lot of biblical imagery. This makes it dramatic and effective. I suspect, and this would be a clever like A-level style point, that readers in the 1950s would be far more educated in the Bible than you, my dear students, would they not? They would have been saturated in these stories. So they would have been more inclined to pick up on these intertextual illusions than we are today in a more secular age. Simon, of course, ends as marble, doesn't he? Do you remember this? And that's a very, very beautiful image. So Golden gives him his finest writing is reserved for Simon. I'll leave you to decide why that might be the case. Of course, really interesting point that I'm going to move on to now is the idea of charismatic leadership versus compassionate leadership. By charisma here, I mean the ability to get up and talk and persuade people in Donald Trump-like fashion. To be a personality that can actually speak especially to the common man. So not appealing to reason, not using reason and logical arguments, but to use emotion. Uh, obviously, I don't have to tell you that this is the gap that is between Jack, the charismatic leader, and Ralph, who's a more compassionate kind of democratic leader. Ralph is like Piggy. He says things like Piggy. He isn't a prophet chief. I hope you'll recognize that this is Roger talking. His tone is that of contempt, isn't it? And again, in some respects, we see democracy as being very fragile, don't we? As relying upon a kind of mature, intelligent, reflective audience. On the other hand, we have a different view of power. Power lay in the brown swell of his forearms. Authority sat on his shoulder and chatted in his ear like an ape. This is Jack. And I think the metaphorical idea of power being in his forearms, we see that idea of physical force, don't we? And this in some ways is a much more powerful idea of authority because it can be backed up by physical punishment. It can force its way in. It doesn't need consent, does it? It actually relies on pure ideas of power. Jack is a master at building a Nazi-like iconography of power. What do I mean by that? He understands the symbolism of power. And we're going to see, aren't we, that he actually has a tendency that he builds a feudal-like imperial idea of power. He understands the power of symbols, whether that be castle rock, whether it be the painted faces, whether it be the use of the sharpened stick and the pig's head. He understands the symbolism extraordinarily well. Before the party had started, a great log had been dragged into the center of the Lord and Jack painted and garlanded like some kind of weird tribal chief, isn't he? He sat there like an idol. This, again, might be a reference to Heart of Darkness, where Kurtz, the Belgian trader, sends himself up, sets himself up as a god in deepest, darkest Africa. And Jack seems to have done the same thing. Look at all the feudal symbolism of power, the great log, garlanded, etc. He sounds like a tribal chief, doesn't he? 
And look at this kind of uh, fecundity and this plenty, this idea of piles of meat, shells of drink, bribing people, understanding that food and drink are the base physiological motivators of mankind. And where does this come out of? This comes out of our Nazi-like ability. The Führer, after, after all, was a kind of god, and he made himself a kind of mythological figure. He brought back the Viking myths, and he made himself a kind of Logi god-like figure. And he used ideas of the Valkyries, and he used the music of Wagner to overawe his audience. This is something I think that on a much smaller, on a micro scale, that Jack does. When a propagandist warns members of her audience that disaster will result if they do not follow a particular course of action, she is using the fear appeal. By playing upon the audience's deep-seated fears, practitioners of this technique hope to redirect attention away from the merits of a particular proposal and towards steps that can be taken to reduce fear. And that is Jack's great insight. It's the insight of Jack and Roger. The utilization of fear and the idea that only they can eliminate the source of the fear. And I'm going to end by talking about the topography of the island. It's very important. Topography means the geographical locations and the settings. And this is something you can weave into your different essay questions. I've spoken about the scar. This visualization of it is really important, isn't it? Because we realize, don't we, that the boys are harming the island. And this is the kind of Gaia idea of nature as a living force. And we see the idea that mankind is the thing that actually brings the scar to the island, this permanent mark. It's very important that we look at the two different bases of the boy. Castle Rock is essentially a vision of a kind of feudal power. Why do you build castle walls? You build castle walls when you live in fear and terror. You build a castle when you are there to stay forever. And that's something that Jack decides at a relatively early stage to abandon ideas of rescue and to build a permanent structure that would symbolize his power and the need for defense. We only have to look at our wonderful president of the United States now to see this notion of a wall still exists today. The notion that there's a terrible enemy seeking to come in is utilized by popular demagogic style politicians to this day. Jack, of course, favors the beach. The beach is temporary, isn't it? He builds huts, he builds shelters, because he sees his role as facilitating rescue. The beach is open. You don't fear things when you live on the beach, do you? There are no walls. You are actually out in the open. What are you doing? You're looking to see, aren't you? You're looking to leave. Your time on the island is ephemeral. Your whole ideology is that of rescue and the return to civilization. Let's go back. If you are in this castle, if you're in Castle Rock, on the other hand, you are establishing a counter idea of civilization. And in this case, it is a kind of crusader idea, isn't it? You will have your castles, you will defend them, and you will fight against the external enemies at any cost. And towards the end of the book, I want to say that the whole idea is a kind of Bildungsroman of Lord of the Flies, a Bildungsroman for Jack. Bildungsroman is the genre in which we look at the education of the central protagonist. The protagonist ends with, uh, begins with naivety. He needs to move, he needs to build, he needs to find out about his things, doesn't he? And this quotation is a fantastic quotation. Ralph wept for the end of innocence, the darkness of man's heart. A very cynical kind of epiphany. But this piece of omniscient narration is absolutely central. This is Golding speaking out through the novel, isn't it? So on the level of form, we need to say, no focalizing here. This is our omniscient nar narrative voice telling us what the story is about. What was the deeper meaning that lay behind the allegory? And it is about this discovery of the darkness in man. So is this Freudian? Is this a kind of Nietzsche thing that we all want power? Is this because we are uh, being delivered a kind of Christian message that only in God can we hope to 
achieve things because we're filled with original sin. And of course, Ralph ends broken at the end of the novel, does he not? And most marvelously, when we do have the return to civilization, civilization is shown in a very dark manner, isn't it? I should have thought that a pack of British boys would have been able to put up a better show than that. Seems to be such a, a lack of empathy in what the officer says. There's something horribly English about it, isn't it? About show being a really important word. Not what was in the boy's heart, but they should have put on a better show, a better display. What does he mean by that? Why does he link it to being British, to nationalism, imperialism? The very values that have caused the Second World War. This man knows nothing, does he? And he's not going to return with a true story of what happens on the island. He's going to mythologize it. And let's see how we see that. Well, first of all, in order to uh, quiet his anxieties, he casts his eye over the trim cruiser. Do we remember this? Trim being a nasty word to use for a warship uh, whose trade is murder and destruction. And it's like he sees it as orderly and pleasant, isn't it? And it kind of makes up for the disorder that he sees on the island. But it's not really a vision of true order, because the ship is there to create disorder, is it not? And this is a very telling quotation. We were together then. Notice he breaks off, because he wants to tell the rest of the story. That hyphen is absolutely crucial, is it not? And then the officer nodded helpfully. And I'm going to suggest to you that that helpfully is not the word of Golding. That's the word of how he sees himself, isn't it? He's the focalizer there, isn't he? He sees himself being helpful. Is he being helpful? No. He's actually the peddler of myth. I know. Jolly good show. Show again. Like the Coral Island. Well, if there's one thing that Golding's novel has told us, that it was nothing like the Coral Island at all. And this is a man who's heard about the violence. He's seen the evidence of the violence. Beaten up Ralph is weeping before him. He sees the boys painted as savages. He sees the island on fire. He whistled earlier. So he actually understood what was happening. But what do we see? What's Golding telling us? He's telling us that society will lie. They will cover up the dark side. They will then peddle a narrative which is much more successful. And this is the narrative of the Coral Island. So it's a bleak ending, isn't it? The closure is, basically, that we will carry on the lie that civilization is happening, etc. We will erase the dark side of our knowledge, etc. Ralph's story will be denied. Will there be an investigation? Almost certainly not. Why not? Because it doesn't benefit the narratives that civilization wants to tell, the comforting narratives of the loveliness of childhood, of the idea that really we're good, really that English children would have done it better. All of these things will be covered up by this incredibly bleak ending. And let's not forget that we began with that nuclear war, did we not? And now the frame at the end of the novel once again, is of one of lies, of mendacity, and the boys will be conveyed by a military vessel that ultimately shows that on the outside world, aggression is the norm too. Microcosm meets macrocosm.